so for the one person that said they saw Dixon do a workshop, you've probably played this game before. So if you've played it, just don't, just pretend like you've never seen it before. We're going to start off with a few games, have some fun before we get into the complex things. So this is a Scottish guy. Everybody familiar with the stereotypical Scottish guy? Yeah? Has anybody here ever heard of a pine martin? No. No? Okay. So basically, they're the Scottish version of a weasel. Everybody know what a weasel is? Good there? Okay. So we're going to answer some questions based on that information. What do we know about pine martins? Are they tricky or dim-witted? Tricky, right? If you wanted to see a pine martin, how would you get there? The Scottish version of a weasel. How are we going to get there? Fly, right? You could maybe take a boat. It would take a little bit of time. Probably not going to walk or drive there. What instrument would a pine martin play? The saxophone. The saxophone, really, Stephen? <laughs> the bagpipe. <laughs> what would a pine martin's voice sound like? High pitched, like a weasel, or it might sound like Sean Connery if you really want to have fun with it. If you make a business deal with a pine martin, is he going to be honest or screw you over? Screw you over. You don't want to make business deals with those pine martins. Um, it doesn't stop there. We can answer even more complex questions. How is a pine martin like a BMW? They're both could be fast, I heard somebody say. They're both foreign. Maybe they're both sleek. How is a pine martin different from a banana? One's a fruit, one's an animal. You peel one and not the other. Different colors. Different colors. <laughs> Hopefully you don't eat one of them. How is a pine martin like a football? They're brown. Brown. They're both probably like a similar size. Okay. You could technically kick both of them, but hopefully you won't. Um, okay, so these are all pretty like random questions, right? Why would I ask you these questions? Before we kind of do a little bit of discussion about that, we're going to play one more game, and I need a volunteer for that. So I had Brandon said he would volunteer. So I'm just going to have you come on up here. <laughs> We have an empty seat there, an empty seat here. Can you see me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're like towering over here. <laughs> All right, so um, first, but hopefully you'll get to actually be in this game because if you know what these things are, I'll have to send you back. So, do you know what this is? Yes. You do? All right, I need a different moment. Does anybody not know what this is? Uh -uh. And wants to volunteer to come up here? Sure. Okay. I'll just stare at you until you say yes. Yeah, I felt like I had to. All right, so there's this one, and then do you know what this is? No. Okay, and do you know what that is? Yeah. You do? Not just a bird. Do you know what kind of bird it is? Oh, no. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so um, I need you to, we're going to receptively identify, so you can just come point. Which one of these is the octolotl? Just pick one. The middle one. Okay, it's this one. Oh. Which one's the octolotl? That one. Yeah, that one right there. Okay. Bravocado, you've got it. <laughs> so which one of these is the octolotl? That one. Good. Bravocado. Which one of these is the pine martin? That one. With the one with the lever? No. This is the pine martin. Which one's the pine martin? The middle one. Awesome. Which one's the pine martin? That one. Perfect. You are so smart. Which one's the lorikeet? Middle. Good. Bravo. Hot. Which one's the lorikeet? No. The lorikeet. Oh, sorry. The, this one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Which one's the oxalotl? Excellent. Which one's the pine martin? That one. Perfect. Which one's the lorikeet? That one. Which one's the pine martin? Oh, sure. No, I mean you can see it. <laughs> no. Middle. Good. Axolotl? That one. Lorikeet? No. 
Okay, so this was all arbitrary matching, right? So you're gonna stay, you're not done oh. yet, sorry. Um, so I was able to teach her with just, you know, obviously with the, the kids we work with, it's gonna take a little bit more training trials, but just one demonstration of like, this is what that is. And then through the rest of the trials, she was able to receptively identify which one was which. So that was trained through direct contingency learning. I showed her the answer, she responded, provided praise, assuming that Bravocado serves as a reinforcer, which it clearly did because she was answering correctly. Um, she's learning this skill. It's so easy, a dog could do it. So this is what basically happened. I showed her um, the word axolotl, had her point, and then we did the Bravocado. That's our stimulus response consequence. Right? Discriminative stimulus, operant, direct reinforcement. That's the three term contingency. Nothing special there, right? Now, let's see what happens when we do it a little bit differently. Okay. Which one of these is the pine martin? No. Good. Which one's the oxalotl? Good. And which one's the lorikeet? Perfect. Which one is the pine martin? Where's the lower key? Good. Wow, our new learning has generalized. I didn't even have to do any training. We just put some new pictures up there and she's able to answer just by looking at a different picture. We've all trained with generalization before as well, right? Now, what is that? Axolotl. Good. What is that? Pine Perfect. What's that? Lower key. Nice. Which one is this? Wait, I didn't teach her that. I never taught her any of those things. I just had her match to sample, and now she's engaging in all of these responses that I've never trained before. How did that happen? This is uh, Dr. Jim Moore's kids, um, and it says, derived relating, almost as good as this donut. And then, it's a generalized operant behavior with sprinkles. I don't know who the little boy is, because that's not his kid, but the girl is his daughter. <laughs> So I directly trained oxalotl, and then she was able to say oxalotl when she saw the picture. That really is the name of that thing? Yeah. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to play. You can sit down now. Okay. Thank you so much. You're a great student. Okay, so now we're going to play one more game, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what all of this means. So we're being, a, it's the, this has, it kind of is based off of stereotypes, so just a disclaimer there. Um, based on the stereotypes that were given about certain places. So axolotls are from Mexico. So based on that, what kind of hat would we maybe expect an axolotl to wear? Sombrero. Sombrero. What is an axolotl's favorite food? Tacos. Tacos, burritos, like Mexican food. What does an axolotl like to drink? Margaritas. Probably margaritas. <laughs> what actor or actress would an axolotl sound like? <laughs> or maybe like Antonio Banderas. Um, if you're wanting to go like cartoony with it, maybe um, like the Taco Bell dog or something like that. Okay, so how did we do all of that? I didn't directly train you on anything from the beginning with the, um, the Scottish guy and the Pine Martin to the pictures that we just did here. To the questions about the, you know, obviously we had to use some stereotypes, but the axolotl being from Mexico. I didn't come up here and do a lesson with any of you on those things, yet you were able to answer those questions. Would your clients that you work with that have autism or other language difficulties be able to do those types of responses without that direct training? The majority of them do not, and that's part of the reason we're doing intervention with them, right? Is to help expand their language repertoires. To answer these questions, we have to understand complex relationships. So we need to know words and their concepts as well as their meaning. But we have to be able to, to program for derived skills. So a lot of the teaching that we traditionally do in behavior analysis, we're doing just that direct stimulus relationship, or sorry, stimulus response consequence training. We sit you know, and do discrete trials, or we are in the natural environment doing discrete trials, but it's all based around, here's this thing, I'm gonna teach you what it is, and provide a prompt and give you reinforcement for it. All of us are in an environment where we can pull from our past histories and answer questions about things 
without having that direct contingency operating on our behavior from that explicit of a standpoint. If that's all we ever do with the learners that we're working with that have language difficulties, how are we going to expect that they'll be able to engage in the same level of complex language and responding that we do? It's probably not going to happen. There's been quite a bit of growth in derived relational responding um, in the research over the past 20 years. And it's not that the way that we traditionally teach language doesn't work. We've all made very great progress with the clients that we work with. However, there are some limitations that we've all encountered as practitioners that could be, we can overcome if we focus on derived relational responding. So one of those is the complexity of the response. A lot of the children that we're working with, the adults that we work with, the responses are not very complex at all. It's usually simple. <laughs> one to three word responses, wrote, memorized, sometimes robotic, like not very uh, you know, complex in nature. The efficiency of our training time. A lot of the children that we're working with, even if they're getting 40 hours a week of intervention, which is pretty rare nowadays, they're still so far behind developmentally from their peers that there's so much to catch up on. If we could make our training time more efficient and get more skills learned for free, then that will help our learner be able to more quickly participate in their natural environment with their same age peers. The omission of novel untrained responses. How many of you have done feature function class training and no matter what you ask your learner, they only ever give you the response that you train. So it's like, you know, tell me something with a tail and you initially train dog and that's the only answer they ever give. And you're like, well, what's something else with a tail? Crickets, right? Nothing. They tell you nothing. So if we can get more derived relational responding happening, we see more of those untrained novel responses. And then lastly, skills appearing beyond Skinner's account of language. So Skinner's account of language is fine. We're not knocking that at all. We still do man, tact, intervogal, echoic training, but language goes beyond that. It goes beyond just the function, and it's more complex than that. When we look at the BACB 5th edition task list, it, it kind of touches on that piece of language being more complex than just the verbal operants. When you look at it going into effect for 2022, some of this is already on there, but it's not as explicit. B15, define and provide examples of, stimulus, of derived stimulus relations. And then G12, use equivalence-based instruction. So right now, the task list talks about equivalence based instruction, you all that are BCBAs now studied stimulus equivalence and memorized that triangle probably for the exam and then forgot about it. So you beat, beat it into your head and then you're like, yes, I'm finally done. I don't have to remember what any of those things are anymore.